Welcome back to the Ultra Speaking Podcast Season 2. That's right, we are back in business. And we've got a huge lineup of guests for this season, starting with the one and only Dr. Tori Higgins, who's the head coach at the Flow Research Collective, an organization whose mission it is to just bring more flow to the world. And so what is flow? It's that amazing feeling where you're so immersed in what you're doing that time disappears and action and effort merge, and it just feels amazing. And Dr. Tori Higgins is on the podcast to tell us how to get more of it in our life. She's worked with, uh, honestly, she's worked with everybody. She's worked with special forces. She's worked with veterans. She's worked with executives, stay-at-home moms, managers, you name it. Dr. Tori Higgins has helped a ton of people find more flow at work and also at home. And what that really means, what I learned in this podcast, is it means squeezing more out of the time that we have, not necessarily by adding more time, but by surfing our energies and finding out how we're getting in our own ways. Before I met Tori, I made a ton of mistakes in my day-to-day that ruined my productivity and got in the way of me feeling more flow. And Dr. Tori is going to tell us stuff that we can do literally today to access more productivity, more energy, and more flow every single day and to have a better home life after work. So I'm super stoked for this episode. I'm so excited that we're back on this podcast. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, five stars, 10 stars, I don't care. Give us a little bit of love because I'm so, so, so glad to be back doing this season. Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Tori Higgins. Tori, I'm going to go over your your bio in just a second because it's it kind of blows my mind, but... First, I just want to say welcome and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. No, I'm super stoked to have this conversation with you. Yeah, amazing. So I know about you a little bit because um, you're an expert in flow. And I learned a a lot from just listening to you speak on flow and the flow cycle. And there's so many things that even after reading several books on the topic, I've never never knew the stuff that's inside your brain. So I definitely want to dive into that. But let me go over your your pedigree really quick because this I just want people to get a sense. This is so, so interesting to me. So you have two degrees. You have a PhD in applied physiology and kinesiology. And I'm going to read these because memorizing yeah. this would have been <laughs> impossible. Uh, with a concentration in biobehavioral science and performance psychology. That's a cool word, performance psychology. You also have a bachelor's in psychology with a concentration in behavioral neuroscience. And then right now you're the peak performance coach, the head coach at Flow Research Collective. But I just want to go over your your resume really quick, just to give folks a sense of the types of titles you've had. You've been the director of peak performance for the Department of Veterans Affairs Warriors to Workforce program. You've been the director of HRS Consulting's Inc.'s Mental Performance and Resilience Optimization Program. What I want to ask you about is is this one right here. It says you started your career as the tactical mental conditioning coach for the Army Special Operations Aviation Regimen. I have never heard a more wild and stacked resume, but I would love to start there. <sighs> so you were training special forces pilots, is that right? Yes, uh, helicopter pilots, crews, support teams, uh, the whole the whole regiment. Yeah. Um, Basically, those are the folks who, if the Green Berets or the Navy SEALs need to go somewhere, uh, SOAR is the group who takes them via helicopter. And so what was your role in that? So any, any mental skills coaching that they needed, any type of mental preparation, resilience, attention control, stress energy management, um, these are folks who are deploying rapidly, regularly. Uh, they have lots of different technical schools that they need to attend. So any type of preparation and support that I could provide, that's what I was there for. Um, making sure that they were ready, resilient, um, can recover rapidly from injuries, trying to prevent injuries wherever possible, um, and then just mm-hmm. tracking immense amounts of information um, at any given time. So really, um, when you think about a profession that needs to have uh, flow on demand, this is it, right? So this is why yeah. um, many of our special operations forces have these tactical mental conditioning coaches 
on staff. Wow. And it was wow. true, a, a, an incredible place to start a career. Um, I learned an immense amount. It was just a total privilege to work with uh, such an elite group of people. Yeah, I, I bet. Now, did you know with your schooling, you know, studying performance psychology, studying uh, psychology, some neuroscience, biology, like there's a whole mesh of sciences in there. How did how did you go from that into this very particular path of, uh, it seems like mental training and peak performance? Well, so I think the, the transition was a wild one. I went from, you know, kind of preparing for a life in academia. Uh, that was, that was the road I was on. And then I was offered this, this position or this opportunity to jump in with special forces and, um, it, it really taught me that I had to learn on my feet rapidly how to contextualize the science um, for a whole range of performers. I didn't have any experience working with the military prior. Um, and it, it threw me into an applied field where I, I had to lean on my understanding of the concepts of the science and then learn on the fly what the performance challenges were and how we can, how we can apply uh, the principles in the textbooks and the research findings. Um, and it, it was a lot of trial and error. Um, but yeah, tremendous learning experience. And, it, you know, it taught me that it taught me that I didn't need to have walked in those shoes. I didn't have to have performed in those ways myself. And I think that you can see kind of from my career path that I'll jump in and start working with a performer in any domain, right? Because it all comes back to what does the science say? So that's interesting because it just makes me think like, what are the, do you remember when you were first starting out, maybe in the special forces, maybe in your next role, um, you have this vault of science behind you. You're seeing these high performers uh, operate, you know, at the, at the top tiers, but they're probably making some obvious mistakes or maybe they're, they don't know the science. So they might be overlooking some like really simple. Do you remember kind of the first obvious hacks or improvements that, that you were coaching people on? Um, that's a great question. And I'm trying to think. So, you know, and it's funny because I think that it comes down to something that we talk about at Flow Research Collective all the time, which is bringing a beginner's mind. And I think that when you're working with experts who have been doing their jobs for so long, they put in so many hours of training, um, they they lose that capacity sometimes to think back to the basics, to ask themselves those fundamental questions. And that's really where I come in. I don't know anything about how you perform, what it takes to do your job well. And so I, that's where I tend to start asking questions. What are the fundamentals? Um, you know, and it might seem like really basic questions, but that's where people stop and well, why do I do it that way? Right. Maybe. Yeah. And maybe there's a better way now that I've learned um, that I have expertise. So a lot of times it's about getting people to take a huge step back from how they've maybe been doing a process for many, many years and hanging a question mark on. Is there a more efficient way? Can I reconfigure this system um, now that I have this different skill set? Um, so I think it, it's really a process and systems question that people don't recognize. So maybe that's the hack is just asking the question, why do I do it this way? And do I still need to do it that way? Uh, uh, and so like, what are the, what are some of the things that you find people reporting to you of, of saying, I'm struggling with this, or can you, can we optimize, you know, this part? What are some of the challenges that you've seen in your career that people at all levels seem to struggle with? Um, well, a, a common theme in the last couple of weeks, I feel like it's every other client I'm talking to, I'm working with a lot of uh, higher level leaders right now. And a question that they haven't been asking themselves is, uh, what does supporting my team and leading them look like uh, if it's not just being available 24 hours a day, right? Is, is the only way to feel, make my team feel supported um, and that I can, I can help them find answers and solve problems. Is it that I have to be reactive to every message that comes across my desk immediately mm -hmm. or answer every email incredibly quickly, or 
do I need to have an open door policy? Right. I think a mm -hmm. lot of leaders immediately kind of go to those answers. Uh, if I don't answer things quickly, my team is going to feel lost without me. And the question mm -hmm. that I'm really challenging a lot of leaders to ask is, is that actually the most caring, supportive thing you could be doing? Because if you draw better boundaries, not only are you going to be uh, protecting your time, right? You're not context switching constantly. Um, so you can do your right. own work more efficiently, but you're also enabling higher levels of autonomy and problem solving and ownership amongst your teams by not being accessible mm. all of the time. Mm. And obviously you don't want to change that open door policy overnight. Um, it takes some communication, but I think it's a really powerful question to ask. And what about people who don't have teams? What are they struggling with? Just individual contributors mm -hmm. that are looking to be maybe getting into leadership or just being higher performant. What are they, what are their challenges? I think a, f a neglect to design their day with intention. So, you know, many people think that the key to elite performance is getting as many things done as possible in a day. And they end up working all day long, right? There's no finish line to their day. You know, you and I have talked about this. They're, you know, reviewing documents on the couch um, after work. They're thinking about a challenging people issue um, instead of connecting with their spouse at dinner. You know, they're not sleeping regular hours. And that is the absolute best way to promote busyness, not progress, right? Time does not yeah, equal yeah. productivity. We need to be accomplishment focused, right? What are you actually, what are the most high value things that you need to achieve throughout your day? And then how can you design your day in accordance with those high priorities? Um, and, yeah. and so, and then you, and then you protect your time. So if you have a high value task that you need to get done, you have to protect um, that, that deep work time, right? Create a flow block where you're managing distractions. You're not living in your inbox. You're not checking your messages. Um, and you know, there, we can go much deeper when we talk about designing our day, paying attention to, it's not just about, okay, I have two hours in the morning and I have a task that, you know, might take two hours long. So that's what I'm doing in the morning. Well, what is the nature of that task? Are you a morning person? When are your energy levels the highest? Uh, knowing mm. ourselves and how we are biologically programmed to perform at our best at different times is really useful information when we're figuring out how we should operate throughout the day. If we're more of a morning person, we should be doing these tasks that take higher level, sophisticated cognition where we need to be really convergent. And then save the meetings and the other other tasks where maybe it's helpful to be a little bit more divergent and creative till later in our day. If you're a night owl, flip it, yeah. right? Do your harder stuff later at night. Um, so I think we are we are so programmed to kind of operate on societal norms of you know uh, high achieving people get up early and do all their best work in the morning. And well, that's just not true, right? There's there's um, something called chronotypes where maybe you are better at night. You should design your day that way. Um, so there's just so many different, um, there's so many different pieces of the puzzle to consider when trying to dial in your own kind of optimized, um, behaviors and level of efficiency. And I think a lot of people do not look under the hood and really explore what those are. Mm, yes. This is why I wanted to talk to you the most because <laughs> we're looking for these types of of individualistic pieces of feedback mm -hmm. not generalizations that we all seem to live by but how can we go by our biology by the science that's dictating it underneath and so i've heard a lot of things i heard energy i heard flow i heard chronotypes i want to go into all of that um Let's go into Do this it. direction of when sh when should somebody work? Because you you mentioned you mentioned this idea of if you if you wake up early and crush it for the next five six hours, um, that's not always the best thing. That kind of surprised me to hear that. What's when mm -hmm. should people work? 
So there's something called chronotype and that is determined based on, and and there's kind of a quick and easy way to figure this out. So um, if you were free of any constraints, you didn't have any responsibilities, you can identify what is the time that you would wake up in the morning and then same deal, when would you go to bed um, and pick the midpoint of that? And that determines your chronotype. So for example, um, I like to get up very early. Um, I like to get up between 5 and 5.30. I go to bed uh, 9, 9.30 p.m. Um, and that makes me a lark, right? I'm a morning person. About 50, 80% of people um, that follow kind of the more typical, you know, wake up closer to 8, um, go to bed a little bit later, uh, 10 or 11. That's some someone called a third bird. And then people who typically identify themselves as, as night owls, um, coincidentally, that's the chronotype that's labeled owls, right? So depending on what your chronotype is, you want to design your day and reshuffle what types of tasks and activities you do based on that chronotype. So for me as a lark, I want to stack all of my um, more challenging kind of higher level cognition related tasks where I need to do a lot of analysis um, and processing. I'm going to do those earlier in the day. And for the task that it's going to be better to be creative and a little bit more divergent, um, it might even be helpful for my mind to wander in those types of tasks, maybe some brainstorming sessions with my team, um, trying to come up with different content ideas. That's the stuff I'm going to stack later in the day. Um, So, and so, and, The science here is incredible, right? So um, one hour of time within your optimal chronotype zone, actually, when it comes to a productivity standpoint, equates to four hours outside of your zone. And this is incredibly important. So if you think about it, if the deadlines are piling up, things are getting super busy, where do you do that extra work? Where do you put in the extra time if you know you're going to have to work long? For me, it makes sense to get up an hour earlier. and and get that extra hour in there because I'm going to get far more done within that chronotype zone versus if I said, oh, I'm just going to tack it on later in my day. I am far less productive later in the day. I'm not going to get my best work done. Um, So being Mm -hmm. intentional about where you you add that extra time. Why is that? Is it, why is it that we are less productive, you know, in the middle of the day um, is it just simply because of our sleep patterns? And if the body wakes up early, it gets tired. Like, are we running out of fuel? Why, why can't I work mm. like a machine for 18 hours a day and then sleep for six of them? <laughs> well, you can, but you are going to burn a ton of cortisol and stress hormones and be deeply inefficient, but you do you, um, we would recommend, uh, really adhering and learning how to harness your natural biorhythms, right? So, you know, everyone's heard of circadian rhythms. Those are 24 hour rhythms. Um, We also have um, rhythms called infradian rhythms, which are longer. Um, So uh, hibernation, the menstrual cycle, things like that. But what we're we're really trying to dial in here uh, are rhythms called ultradian rhythms. And those are 90 minute cycles. And, you know, there are areas in our brain that basically we have these biological clocks Um, It's an area in our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And so what this does is uh, we have these natural oscillations of biorhythms that through the science we're learning to harness so that we can lean into when we naturally have energy peaks and then know when to pull back when we have natural ebbs um, in that energy. So we're not burning through all of those stress hormones to grind through it. Um, and, and so what we're teaching people, um, so this is one of our programs, zero to dangerous, uh, teaches folks to bring an awareness to when are those energy levels typically the highest based on your chronotype zone. And then within that zone, we still have those 90 minute, um, ultradian rhythms. And so we we're telling people design your day based on 90 minute work blocks, where you lean into that energy peak, um, you can ride it to the top, get into flow, um, and then plan that 10 to 15 minute micro recovery. So when your body is naturally um, having an energy ebb, you're taking a break. So you're actually going into recovery mode versus having to kind of put it into six gear just to grind through that. Yeah, yeah. 
and these these 10 15 minute breaks talk to me about those because i've heard you mention a lot in the past about um this idea of breaks and recovery mm-hmm. how how much do we buy into that how much is that like our doctor telling us oh you know yeah you should uh, you should walk for 20 minutes a day and we're like okay like how important are these breaks really when it comes to you know people who really just work a lot yeah no great question um i mean i guess the answer is it depends on how much you like getting into flow right if you want to get into flow if you want to be operating um at the peak of your own effectiveness then recovery and breaks are vital. They're non-negotiables because the reality is that operating in flow requires massive energy expenditure. We're burning a ton of important neurotransmitters uh, to actually be Mm. in flow. And in order to consistently get into flow throughout your day, right, you have to fill up the fuel tank. You have to go into recovery mode so that you can actually replenish those those neurotransmitters. And what we promote is if you get really good at recovery, because we're all about being competitive and, and, and going hard at FRC, right? If you get really good at recovery, what you can do is learn to accelerate the speed with which you recover, return to baseline so that you can more quickly and consistently get into the flow state. So that's why I said, depends on how much you like flow. If you really like flow, you want to get into flow multiple times a day on command, then you have to be truly dedicated to this concept of recovering and recovering regularly so that you have fuel in the, in the tank to get into flow. Okay. So let me, let me recap just so I understand it. Um, first of all, what's mm-hmm. interesting is you're suggesting around 90 minute blocks. And I've heard of this thing called Pomodoros, which are more like 25, five. Could you comment a little bit on that? Is there a, is there one versus the other, or is kind of the idea the same in, in both? So, you know, I like Pomodoro because it, it, it challenges folks to really concentrate their attention, right? So usually if we know we only have to focus for a certain period of time, you know, that that finish line is not that far away. If we just stay focused, we can do it, right? And then we have a break right around the corner. So for that reason, from an attentional control perspective, I think it's really helpful. But the the challenge that I have there by kind of using that that rule and applying it to anything we're doing, no matter kind of where we are energy wise, uh, distractibility wise, because those things vary, right, based on the individual, what you're working on, how much sleep you had the night before. The challenge I have there by always applying that same timing rule is that you could potentially be pulling yourself out of flow, right? If you got through the struggle phase, you get into flow, you're working 15 minutes in, and all of a sudden, you know, that timer goes off in in 20 or 25 minutes, you might be deeply in flow and you just yanked yourself out of it unnecessarily. You didn't, you didn't need a break. Right. Okay. So So, 25 minute could be kind of the, the intro for folks, the people who have difficulty maybe concentrating for a while. Maybe that's where you start. mm -hmm. You can, you're saying you can work your way up to 90 minutes and yep. can we push that? Can, can we do two hours? Can we do three hours or are there diminishing returns at some point and we need to recharge the batteries with some sort of break? Great question. And I think it's, it's deeply dependent on, you know, what task you're working on your skill set. You know, Steven Kotler talks all the time about, you know, he does push it uh, longer, oftentimes two hours, maybe three, if he's writing a book, right? And this is someone who has spent a lot of time designing their day and is an expert at getting into flow on command. I think that if you are pushing it for longer, if you do feel like you're getting into flow, you're staying in flow for that longer duration, great but you have to be intentional about what did you have planned for the rest of the day? Because if you went that hard, emptied the tank completely and you had something else Mm -hmm. to work on, Mm -hmm. that might be a real challenge. Um, Maybe if you are, are great at recovery too, and you have a longer flow block in the morning and then you take a longer, maybe couple hour break where you really dial in some recovery, you do things that are really going to fill the tank Mm -hmm. back up, maybe stacking things like, Um, you know, we talk about 
going to doing a sauna, doing some kind of heat therapy, going for a walk, some light um, movement, right? Something that's really going to flush a lot of those stress um, chemicals, get some nitric oxide pumping to wash away some of some of those struggle, challenge, stress um, chemicals in the bloodstream. Maybe then you could have another flow block later in the day. But what I really caution people to get away from is um, this idea that I need to go hard for a really long time throughout the day to be productive. We actually become so much more efficient. Um, we really optimize what we can produce and accomplish in a day when we work on these shorter cadences, these 90, maybe to 120 minute blocks, pull back, recover 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe have a, an hour long recovery midday and then get back to it. Right? That's really where we optimize. Nice. I want to get to a couple of questions uh, that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, Bobby T says, I never knew taking breaks are associated with flow. I didn't know that either. I wanted to ask you for those shorter breaks, for those five to 15 minute breaks, what is a, what's an optimal break look like? Can I do anything? I love that question. No, you cannot do anything, right? So, um, we talk a lot about high flow breaks versus energy sapping breaks and energy sapping breaks are the things that many of us kind of lean on um, when we think about taking a break. So uh, looking at our phones, scrolling any kind of social media or news cycle, watching TV, playing video games, going to talk to our coworker about something exciting down the hall. Those are all energy sapping breaks we want to lean on breaks that are going to be low stimulation, right? That are not going, it's not going to cause our nucleus accumbens in our brains to just um, pump dopamine, right? Because when we take a break that is uh, dopamine inducing, we don't want to go back to the work, right? We are now engaged and we are, um, you know, we're having a great time. We're motivated to stay now with the social media scrolling or talking to our, our coworker about something fun. We want to take a break that not only helps us go into recovery mode, um, it's going to be low stimulation, but also a great trick here is to pick a break that makes going back to the work actually enticing, so, for example, the extreme version that we tend to recommend is wall staring. Stare at a wall long enough, you are going to be dying to get yeah. back to that content creation, right? Um, you know, if, if wall staring is not for you, my personal favorite quick break, especially if I'm deep in the struggle on something, um, I'm really, I may be feeling a little bit frustrated, my wheels are really turning, and I need to get my mind off of the thing just long enough to hopefully down-regulate my nervous system, allow my subconscious to come in. That's what's really going to get me into flow. The way I do that, um, I keep a foam roller next to my desk. And that is a great um, high flow break because what it does, it gives you, oh, Michael, do you have one too? I love it. I love it. So such a fantastic thing to have next to your desk. Ah, I appreciate you. So that is a great tool because you get a strong kinesthetic input. And what it does is it gets you out of your head and into your body. And one of this, the keys to moving from the struggle phase through release into flow is, remember, we need struggle for flow. We need something that gets us to really pay attention, to dial in our resources. Um, we need that challenge to prime us to get into flow. But we also need to be able to downregulate from that challenge to bring the subconscious in. Because remember, flow feels effortless, right? We don't have that inner critic, um, you know, talking to us, not on our shoulder, getting us to second guess or wonder if this is the right decision. In order to access that, to um, activate the areas of our brain, like the default mode attention network, um, we need to downregulate a little bit. So we need to get our mind temporarily off the struggle. Um, so using any of these uh, release strategies like foam rolling, a little bit of light stretching, um, a short walk, um, low stimulation, down-regulating down -regul the nervous system. Those are kind of the boxes you want to check for a high flow break. Yeah, this this was news to me, by the way, because I always felt like 
I finish my 60 to 90 minute work session, I deserve a little TikToking. I deserve a little phone scrolling. Mm -hmm. And that was like my little reward. What you're saying is like that, that ruins it. That because that gives me all mm-hmm. the all the good feeling chemicals that ultimately will deplete me of of the energy I need to get back into it. So you're saying make your breaks more boring than the work that yeah. you need to do, and and something that gets you out of your head completely. Now, when you get back to your task, so I do I do a ninety minute work session. I take five minutes and I go for a walk or I foam roll maybe I take 10 minutes. Now I'm going back into work. Um, and there's struggle. There's like, I'm, I'm not, fe- I'm not in the zone anymore. Now it just feels like I, I entered a totally new phase. Um, is that normal to, and, and how do I get back into the zone when I feel like I'm just starting at nothing again? Yeah, great question. So one of the ways that I try to preemptively teach clients to avoid that like deep struggle right when you come back from a break is actually before you take the break, leave yourself a breadcrumb or two, right? So if you're working on a task and you've kind of hit the edge of your struggle, you're recognizing you're not productive anymore. That feeling of frustration is pretty high. Before you leave to take the break, before you leave to go foam roll or wall stare, try and synthesize a question, what is it that you're trying to solve here? Give yourself a problem statement and then leave. Mm. When you come back, the Mm. beauty of that, uh, it's called the MacGyver method. The beauty of that is that problem statement, that question has been incubating in your subconscious during the break while you got your mind off of the thing. And you're actually far more likely to generate the solution. Um, And it's incredible. People are like, I don't know if that sounds kind of wacky, right? They try it out and then, Dr. Tor, I can't imagine, I cannot believe it, but it absolutely, I was, I was sitting there for about two minutes and boom. Right. But we've all had that experience. Everyone, everyone has that experience of, I have all my best ideas in the shower, right? That was a release break. That's your subconscious coming in. So we're intentionally engineering it by before we leave for the break, coming up with that problem statement, giving it to our subconscious to handle so that when we come back, that struggle phase is shortened. Can you talk about the struggle phase? Uh, There's a, there's phases to uh, call. There are phases that comprise what's called a flow cycle. This is something that I learned from you. Mm -hmm. There are four phases. One of them is flow, but another one is Mm -hmm. struggle, which is strange that, that that's a phase of, of the flow cycle. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah, we so we need challenge and struggle for flow, because if something is not challenging, right, we will not get activated enough to perform at our best. Think about all of the tasks or activities or experiences where you've experienced flow. They likely were not easy. There was some level of difficulty there, something that pushed you to operate you know, at the edge of your skill set. Um, if, if it's too easy, our, our, our nervous system activation is too low. We're not going to be operating in that optimal state of consciousness, which is what flow is, the, our optimal state of consciousness. So we need something, first of all, that's going to activate our executive attention network. That's what dials in our attention. It focuses us, up. It focuses us on something, it mobilizes our resources um, to get us to really pay attention to do the thing. Right, really makes us lean mm. in. And this is like the loading phase for flow, where we're loading our, our brain with information. And this is, you know, it's going to cause a little bit of stress. We need it to, um, to, ca- to drive the secretion of norepinephrine and cortisol. These are kind of the, um, this is, like I said, the loading phase for flow. It's priming the system. The second piece to that, though, in the, in the next phase in the flow cycle is release. So I talk a lot about we kind of need to flip multiple switches on to get into the flow state. So the first uh, switch is the struggle phase where we turn on that executive attention network. But then the second um, switch that we need to flip is the default mode network. That's the subconscious. That's what gives us that beautiful, um, the combination of the two gives us that beautiful transient hypofrontality pattern of activation in our brains where 
certain aspects of our attention and awareness are amplified. Um, that's why action and, and awareness tend to merge when we're in flow. Um, but mm -hmm. that inner critic, that voice that really gets in our way and tends to slow us down, um, you know, leads us to second guess our decisions. Um, that's completely quieted. That turns off. Um, and that's why, um, you know, people talk about, you know, some of the different phenomenology of flow is it feels effortless. It feels amazing. There's this time dilation where you tend to lose track of time. That's because we need both of these areas of our brain, our conscious and our subconscious activated in this very unique way. Um, so that's why we need struggle, but that's also why we need release in order to get to that third piece, which is flow in the cycle. In interesting. So at first, the brain needs to be challenged. It needs to be puzzled in a way where it turns on and it starts saying, okay, I got I to gotta actually put in some effort to lift this thing. And somewhere during the lifting process, if you stick with it, uh, you, you forget about the, the heaviness of it and the challenge of it. And you start to engage with it where suddenly time disappears and you're just in it. The action merges. Um, I've heard you say before that like a lot of the, a lot of people's opportunity to get into flow is shortcut at the struggle phase. Like people almost um, get in their own way during this initial struggle phase and never reach flow. What is it that they're doing or not doing during these first few minutes that are preventing their access? Yeah. Um, well, you know, many people live their entire careers in the first two phases of the flow cycle. So we talk about, you know, people sit down to do a challenging thing. And, you know, we just said struggle is vital for flow. But here's the thing about struggle. It's deeply unpleasant, right? It's not fun to struggle. It's not fun uh, to feel difficulty. And so what oftentimes happens is we sit down we start to struggle and maybe we get 15 to 20 minutes into that struggle and then it becomes unbearable and we reach for our phone. We take, we deserve that break of TikTok, right? right. Because, you know, making this, making this slide presentation or preparing a talk, you know, not, you know, isn't fun. So we look for something that is more, we seek pleasure and we reset the cycle. So 15 to 20 minutes in, we distract ourselves. We don't realize that flow is right around the corner if we just hung in there a little bit longer. And what we end up doing is resetting ourselves and just bouncing from struggle to recovery mm -hmm. and back. And that struggle phase just gets um, just completely unnecessarily prolonged because we help keep self-distracting and resetting out of it. Yeah. Uh, so this blew my mind, I think. This was the biggest one. I've become more aware of noticing my urge to context switch, to do something that yeah. is unrelated to the task at hand, um, justifying it as either reward or this will be really quick or, you know, you deserve this, Michael. You've worked for years. Whatever it is, I'm just like... And so now I'm seeing it as like not only... Um, not only is that a bad habit, it's like literally collapsing everything that I've built up in the struggle phase. And I could be just on the precipice of getting into flow, but it's giving into that distraction that it brings me back to zero. And then I have to start over again. That to me is, is um, yeah, that was just like a totally new dimension of awareness that um, I've seen now in myself, like, Oh, wow. I just, I distract myself a ton. And you do certain things to mitigate it, right? So whether, for me, it's I leave my phone outside of um, arm's reach and it's always face down. Um, so it just, it, mm. it, uh, the, the opportunity to mindlessly pick it up is no longer there. And when you start to do things like that, whether it requires some environmental engineering to mitigate the distractions around you, you set rules for yourself, whatever it is, what you start to recognize is that wow, I have been driving so much inefficiency in my problem solving process or my content creation process. Because when you stick with the thing, right, and actually make it through that struggle phase and get into flow, you, you access this optimal state of consciousness where you have better ideas, 
you connect the dots mm. more quickly. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things that it self perpetuates because it feels so good to get into flow that, um, you just get better at protecting that time and being very, very conscious of how do I make it through that struggle phase as efficiently as possible? How can I get it, get out of my own way to get there quickly? Because man, the work feels good when I do. I, I want to get to the questions in the chat, but you touched upon something first um, that I remember you saying around fully on, fully off. I remember that phrase in my mind as like a, 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 a way of life almost. Um, and I, I bring that up because what you're, what you're describing to me is like, okay, you work for 90 minutes, you're taking a break, the temptation is to check your phone, you can't do it. You take your wall staring break, you come back to work, it's hard, the, the PowerPoint slide mm -hmm. is not writing itself, you want to go check the website or check the phone, you can't or else you're going to ruin your chances. So it's constantly fighting your temptation to distract yourself, which kind of made me think of like, man, maybe we all need to just like work in the woods or somewhere where like it's just like full disconnect but that brought up this phrase for me of fully on fully off which i think is a little bit more realistic for for modern society can you talk about what that phrase means yes so you're talking about the adopting a binary approach to work and this is super important and it's i think game changing for so many people this is i think one of the highest impact uh, strategic changes that our clients make. And it's this notion of designating work time, creating a clear finish line for when the workday ends, and then completely transitioning to your life. And what we mean by that, and I was kind of alluding to it earlier, that so many people think that it's all about just cramming in as much work time as possible throughout the day. And they end up, you know, okay, I, maybe I leave work at 5 PM, but I'm still checking emails. I'll finish this one task after dinner. And what you end up doing is creating this low value work time where you're half working, but kind of relaxed and you just become completely suboptimal at both. And so what we're promoting is you either work in sixth gear with high intensity, working as productively as possible, or you're completely off. You're recovering, you're disconnected, uh, no more, uh, you know, really trying to eliminate this gray zone of half working, kind of half relaxing activities in between. So fully working, completely engaged, or completely off enjoying your life. Right. Because the life part is also something you want to feel flow in also something that Correct. probably the science supports as well. Yeah. Um, a hundred percent. This is really, really fa fascinating stuff. Uh, I want to hear more questions in the comments based on what we've talked about. One that I I'd like to get to right now is Bijou's question. Um, Bijou says question for Tori, how, how to be motivated and stick to new habits on self-improvement for a long period of time. It feels really easy to slip back to, to the old habits. Yeah, great question. Great question and one that we get all of the time. I would say the, the place to start with this is what is the belief fueling the action? Actions follow belief. So uh, if we're not deeply connected to the why behind what we're doing, what, what behavior change we're trying to implement, then it probably isn't going to stick. So understand if you have this, I should be doing this, but you know, I've never been very successful in the past. I'm more of a, this kind of person. And you start to create this narrative, right? That's, that's the belief that you need to attack um, to really ensure that that, that behavior is going to stick long-term. Um, so connecting with why it's important, trying to do kind of a pre-mortem on where do you tend to get in your own way? Where do you tend to talk yourself out of it? identify those so that you can challenge them. Um, and then where do you tend to fall off, right? Trying to understand where are the patterns there? How can I be more strategic? If you're leaning on willpower and discipline, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? We, we are going to be much better at creating long-term behavior change if we can identify environmental engineering or deploying uh, friction 
to help create the, the behavior that we're trying to deploy. So for example, um, with the phone, if you have a phone habit uh, with social media, you can deploy friction by either number one, deleting the social media apps off of your phone. Um, so that way you would need to actually look them up on the computer or look them up as websites. Uh, if that feels way too extreme for you, but you want to reduce the amount of time you're spending on social media and time wasting, you could deploy friction again by moving them all to a folder uh, up the, on the last screen of your phone. So that would be an example of how to deploy friction to prevent you from doing a behavior um, that you're trying to eradicate. You can also reduce friction to make certain new behaviors easier. So if you want to be going to the gym, uh, packing the gym bag, uh, have it ready to go in the morning so that there's the least amount of friction possible for you to have all your things together, to just get in the car and go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like battling the phone is really one of the biggest things for, for all of us. The thing that we're almost unwilling, like we'll do everything else, you know, we'll, we'll wake up at 3am yeah. if we have to, but please don't take away my five minute phone break yeah. in between sessions. Um, yeah, we talk about, another uh, we have an entire module uh, called severing technology's tentacles, right? Because that is, that is the hold that it has on us. Right. It's powerful. Right, right. Um, another concept that stood out to me in my notes here was this idea of brainstorming after lunch. Um, I literally feel like uh, I'm, a, I'm more of a third bird, I think it's called, where I, I wake up around usually seven naturally. And mm. so I can go till about 12, 12 or one. And then I feel like a huge energy depletion. Then I eat food and then I feel like I'm dead weight for like the next hour or two. I've started incorporating this idea of no, 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 don't just, you could actively recover during that time, but also there's, there's this, you're in a your special energy state. Can you use it? to your advantage. Can you talk a little bit about this idea of um, the after lunch kind of brain dead state? Well, I like, I like the idea that you're leveraging the natural ebb and energy there to go more divergent. So plugging in, you know, some type of activity or task where you're, it's actually helpful to have more of a mind wander type situation. So I think you can, you can reshuffle what you're doing to kind of fit that natural ebb in energy. Um, but like you said, I think another, another option would be to plug in some active recovery time so that you can swing back up into a work block um, after lunch. Yeah. Always a choice. Do I rest or do I, do <laughs> I work? Um, excellent. Well, I want to, I want to chat a little bit about uh, flow research collective and zero to dangerous. Um, there was one other question in the chat that I want to get to. This is Jenny's question. She says, uh, folks with ADHD experience hyperfocus, and their experience of flow can be a bit different. Curious if Tori has any comments about the science of flow for folks with ADHD. Yes. Um, so we have many clients that this is something that we, we talk about all the time. And you're absolutely right that ADHD can cause hyperfocus. And when you, you can leverage that to get into flow, but there's a dark side of flow too, where it actually can become really counterproductive. You can stay in flow for too long. Um, sometimes people even forget to go to the bathroom, things like that. Like it's because the time you lose track of time when you're in flow. So for that type of situation, I tend to suggest having some kind of timer so that you don't get completely lost in it, where you blow up the rest of your schedule because you got so immersed in a task that everything else fell off your radar. So really thinking about how can you construct some guardrails to your flow experience so it stays in that healthy, productive place that you don't lose track of your other priorities. Um, and then the inverse is also true. So sometimes it can be challenging for folks with ADHD to kind of um, accurately deploy flow. They, can ha they get hyper-focused on maybe things that are not high priorities. So again, establishing some guardrails so that um, you're not you know, getting into flow on lower value tasks. And it, it comes down to a designing the day type situation and then using things like timers um, and very clear goal setting to keep yourself on track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, great question. I guess I have to ask, we, we, we kind of touched upon this, but um, flow in family life, you know, for so many of us where the reason we're listening to the podcast is we're like, how can we squeeze more out of the day so I could be more productive? Um, then I turn off the laptop, I go to dinner, but my part of my brain is still thinking through the emails or just like, how do, how do you suggest somebody click into flow with the people you love the most with kind of the setting that work is, is in the background? How do you, how do you get flow in, in this space when your brain is still somewhere else? Such a great question. And so, you know, we're all about practicing intentionality, being deliberate with our most precious resources of time and attention. And so when you're, when you're with family, you want to be just as intentional as if you were setting goals for work, right? So how can you use group flow triggers with your family? So for example, um, you know, open communication, active listening, really being intentional about unitasking when you're with your family, again, with the phone, right? Leave the phone in another room um, so that you can be fully present and allow yourself to be immersed and meaningfully connect with your family. These are group flow triggers. So setting the stage to be completely present um, with your family is huge. Um, I would say also, we're ta- we've talked a lot about active recovery today. Kids are amazing at lots of different fantastic active recovery protocols like aimless play and laughter. Those are deeply recovering activities and kids are better mm. at them than us, right? So leaning into that mm. um, by, you know, set the intention to be present with your kids. Don't be doing other things like checking the email, and and follow their lead, and that can be that can be the way to flow there too. That's interesting. Uh, what is group flow? You said group flow triggers. What is group flow? Mm. So we can have individual flow, and there are a host of triggers that we can use to um, get into flow as individuals. But the research shows that there's actually something called group or team flow, and the cool thing is it's an even better experience than individual flow. And this is where um, incredible insights and innovation come from. And there's a fantastic book by Keith Sawyer called Group Genius that does a really wonderful job of um, reviewing all of the research in this space. But just like individual flow where there are triggers there, there are group flow triggers as well. Um, so things like being uh, complete concentration, open listening, shared clear goals, um, the yes and group flow trigger. Uh, so I know this is one that you will probably resonate with you, um, but it's really a communication style that really opens um, the lines of communication, always seeking to be additive rather than stifling other people's ideas. So you can really, if you understand these group flow triggers, you can get really effective at setting the stage um, for effective group interactions to access flow together and perform in this optimal space uh, as a collective group. Mm. It reminds me of like these Power Ranger rings where like if everyone puts their (laughs) ring together and clicks in, it generates like this force. And I guess in the metaphor, you're saying the rings are like your attention, your willingness to be in the, th- the conversation or the thought bubble that everyone is envisioning. And um, I've noticed before that like, yeah, w- in team meetings and stuff, if as soon as somebody opens that laptop or checks their phone, it feels like they snap out of the the dream we were all in. And so yeah. the group flow maybe gets broken a little bit. Exactly. Exactly. And so um, in any of our training programs, we challenge everyone who attends our sessions to take ownership of being a group flow catalyst, because even having that one person that's not engaged, uh, is distracted, can pull the team out of group flow. So let's talk about that, your training programs. Um, The one I keep hearing about is called Zero to Dangerous. Yeah. Sounds dangerous. Yep. Can, you, zero- can you tell me a little bit about it? <laughs> I, sure. Yeah. Zero to Dangerous is our flagship program and it's designed to teach people how to access this optimal state of consciousness flow 
on demand. We, it's an eight week program. There's eight modules, lots of incredible video content. It's based on neuroscience. Um, we update the content regularly with cutting edge research. And uh, it, like I said, eight modules over eight weeks, it's comprised of group training sessions. You have asynchronous um, learning, and then you also get one-on-one coaching with a peak performance coach like myself. So you have the opportunity to learn the concepts and leverage a group of other high performers, and then you can dive even deeper and contextualize the information with your own personal coach as well. And we cover things like flow blockers. So distraction, stress, burnout, we make sure we clear those, we clear the way for flow. And then we talk about how you can learn to design your day using many of the concepts that you and I have talked about today um, to access a flow state multiple times throughout the day, how to accurately deploy flow so that you're crushing your your highest value, most important tasks. Um, We also talk about group flow, goal setting, how to develop clarity on what you want to do with these newfound skills, what is your purpose, and what motivates you. Um, That last piece is super important because we want to make sure before you leave the course that you know how to really access what intrinsically motivates you because that's your limitless fuel. That's what keeps you going, keeps you hungry, keeps you wanting to level up as a peak performer. Mm -hmm. Mm. What is it about the course that like if I were to just listen to the podcast and try to, you know, figure out if I'm a lark or an early bird and then like start to, okay, I'm not going to check my phone. Like what, what will the course, what does it give me? Or maybe how does it help me more than trying to go on this, on this improvement myself? Yeah. Great question. You know, I think there's so much nuance to all of these concepts. And that's the beautiful thing that we're never done optimizing and realizing our potential. There's always more for us. There's always a way to level up. There's always a way to become more efficient or more effective or to scale our impact. Um, And so that's what Zero to Dangerous does. No matter where you are as a performer, where you are in your journey, uh, there's a way to level up. And so as a coach, that's why I have the most fun job because I get to contextualize this science in a different way for everyone and help uh, each and every person find their next you know, few percentage points. How do we squeeze out that next percentage point? When you thought this was it, this is the best that I can do, um, things are going great. Wow, I can go even farther. I can go even faster. I can, I can reach mm-hmm. even farther. So um, um, yeah, there's, we talked... We talk about, um, you know, bringing a beginner's mind. There is something for everyone in the field of peak performance. And sometimes we don't know what it looks like until we really start looking under the hood and exploring it. And oftentimes you need other people to help you see those blind spots where you might have been getting your way. What's that new perspective that you hadn't considered before? Right. Yeah, it sounds like the people and, and the coaches themselves um, seem to be the biggest value add of like trained experts who can kind of catch you on your BS and help you do the things that are maybe the hardest or maybe the blind spots that we have. Yeah. Exactly. If Thanks. you're looking for a passive learning experience, um, Flow Research Collective is not for you, right? It's guaranteed you're going to have coaches that are going to be challenging you and pushing you and, and really encouraging you to to think about things in a way that you've never done that you, you haven't before, and maybe been doing things that you've never done before. Um, but it's, it's a high performance culture and it is a blast to be a part of. I bet. Nice. Um, let's, let's kind of, uh, finish on flow research collective. I want to learn a little bit more. What, what is the flow research collective? Um, where can folks find it? What are you guys, what are you guys up to there? So many different things. So the Flow Research Collective uh, is an organization. It was uh, founded by Rian Doris and Stephen Kotler. Stephen Kotler is a famous New York Times bestselling author. Uh, He's written some amazing books like The Rise of Superman and Art of the Impossible. Art of the Impossible is kind of a great primer to what we do at the Flow Research Collective. But um, in a nutshell, we have two primary aims. 
One is to bring flow to the global community. So increasing um, the world's access to flow on command. That's where our training arm comes in. Those are our programs like Zero to Dangerous and Climbing Mount Bold, um, which is our leadership course, and Flow Trainer Accelerator, which is our uh, train the trainer model for coaches. And then we have a research arm where we are decoding the neurobiology of flow so that we can feed those findings into our training. Wow. Wow. A lot of cool stuff going on there. Um, Tori, final question for you. What's the bottom line of all of this? What's the, what's the message you want all of us to take home around peak performance or maybe around flow or wellness? What's the most important thing that you feel needs to be said one more time? I think in a nutshell that something I always try to impart on people that I work with is that we tend to get in our own way. We tend to limit ourselves and our potential as human beings, what we, the, the good that we can do in the world, the impact that we can create in our family, our communities, um, the global community as a whole, we tend to undershoot that. Right. And so what if you got a little bit more curious about the, you know, the heights that you could reach how far could you go? What are you truly capable of? You really, I, I would be willing to bet that you could surprise yourself and use the science to try it, test it, run the experiment. Amazing. Amazing. Well, your stuff works. I've seen it in my own, in my own life, just the power of catching myself on self-distracting, on prioritizing active rest, on going through the struggle facing that blank piece of paper and waiting, waiting for that flow to come. So it's really made a huge, huge difference in just how I am at work, but also how I click off and am able to be with my wife and my cat. So I can't speak more highly of you and, and your programs. And uh, I just want to say thanks so much for, for sharing all this wisdom with our, our viewers and our listeners. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. I really appreciate you having me. And I want to say, likewise, I, it was a tremendous, tremendous experience working, working with you. And I've been singing and shouting your praises from the rooftops. I've, I'm a huge ultra speaking evangelist. Uh, now I've directed many a person to your, to your podcast and your website. Mm -hmm. And I, I th thank you so much for, for, for teaching me your ways too. learned a tremendous amount from you as well. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining. Fantastic to have you, Tori, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.